Welcome to the Smoke Pit. As we sit down in the Smoke Pit to enjoy more of each other's stories, I would like to quickly set the stage for this episode. The most recent story shared on the channel involved the strange sighting of a Roman ghost by an exhausted American soldier in Vietnam. Thomas, the soldier in that story, surmised that even he wasn't sure if what he saw was real or simply the result of a waking dream, as he tried to stay awake and alert during an early morning fire watch. Thus, that idea of where our dreams end and our reality begins becomes something of a mysterious question. What is most striking about Thomas's story seems to be how a man who didn't speak Latin could either hallucinate or dream about hearing a ghost speaking a Latin phrase, a phrase about his own death, that was once a common expression among ancient Roman soldiers. And he no less saw this vision and heard this cryptic message while he himself was fighting in a war in Vietnam, surrounded by death and violence, a situation which seemed to be eerily appropriate to be reminded about his own mortality. Although these following stories were not shared in direct response to that episode, oddly enough, several of your fellow viewers have shared their own accounts that appear to pose this same question. And that question is, in a world of strange, paranormal, and supernatural experiences, how do we know when we can trust where our dreams end and where our reality begins? This first story was one submitted by an Air Force veteran, Xavier. He writes, I grew up in rural Missouri, in a small town about an hour outside of St. Louis, a real drive through town in flyover country. I served six years active duty with the United States Air Force as an avionics tech on F-16s. Then I joined the Air National Guard, where I cross-trained into a command and control position, or AFSC, working in air operations centers. I also did a stint on the state's weapons of mass destruction civil support team as a Seaburn E recon NCO. For you non-military folks, I do apologize for all of the acronyms. I still work for the Air Force, but now as a contractor. But all of that aside, my story actually takes place during a series of events that happened before I enlisted in the military, beginning when I was a kid. From the age of about 8 or 9 until maybe 11 or 12 years old during my 4th, 5th, and 6th years of school, I would repeatedly wake up during the night to see this being with black eyes peering down at me like it was standing behind the headboard of my bed and I couldn't seem to move. I'm still not sure if I was suffering some kind of sleep paralysis. Because of that repeating nightmare, or waking dream, or whatever it was, I developed an intense fear of the dark and started sleeping with the light on, with the covers pulled up and wrapped around my head so only my nose and mouth were visible. A, a lot of kids have nightmares, although I don't know how long they continue to have the same one, so admittedly, that could simply have been a bad dream, inspired by watching the Star Wars movies. But for me, this recurring nightmare continued to happen for longer than I care to admit. Until I wasn't a child anymore, and became an adult. And one night, in the early 90s, when I was 18, I woke up in the middle of the night to see something I hadn't seen before. What? There was now a strange blue light flooding my room. I remember thinking that the color of the light reminded me of the blue color my mother had painted the room when we first moved into the house, but the walls weren't supposed to be blue now, because we'd repainted them white two years earlier when I was 16. So then I thought it must just be a trick of the moonlight coming in through the window. I looked at the alarm clock, the time displayed in red digital numbers, 3.01 a.m. 
I wanted to fall back to sleep, but for some reason, I now felt completely awake. Great. That irritated me, because it was way too early to be waking up. And as I'm lying there, staring up at the bedroom ceiling, I suddenly felt something move on my bed. So, I looked down towards my feet. And there, crawling towards me, was what I can only describe as a gray alien. She, I don't know how I knew her gender, it was just intuitive, she froze when I looked at her. Unlike the ones you see on TV, whose skin is a uniform color and smooth, her skin had a natural, more aged appearance, and she was staring at me, considering me, with these giant almond-shaped black eyes. I also knew that she looked somewhat different than the thing that I used to always see staring down at me. As I looked at her, she tilted her head to one side, and that's all I remember. That's when I passed out. When I woke up later that same morning and recalled what I'd seen, I immediately dismissed it as a dream. Fast forward a few years, and now I'm in my early 20s, making my first attempt at college and spending the summer at my parents' new home. Their house was in a heavily wooded area, and the last one down at the end on a gravel road. Once more, I woke up in the middle of the night, this time to a blinding white light flooding my room. I looked over, and it was like the exterior wall wasn't there anymore and four or five small human shapes were passing through it, moving towards me. Once more, it was too much for me, and I passed out. When I woke up that next morning, again, I immediately dismissed it as a dream. That is, until later that morning, I heard my parents discussing a dream my dad had. In his dream, he apparently saw these gray aliens in his room. And during the dream, they began doing something inside his stomach. And he said that he was screaming. But my mom stayed fast asleep next to him, and that I never came to his rescue. Another fast forward to the summer of 97, and I'm spending the summer in Atlanta, Georgia. I wake up from a nap to find myself lying face down on the bed, which I thought was strange because I'm usually a side sleeper. But then I realize I'm being held down. And when I begin to struggle to get up, I felt these unseen hands, which were extremely strong, quickly stop me from moving. I began to panic, and then I felt a sharp pain behind my right knee, as if something like a syringe had pierced my skin. Then it's over. I felt myself slip back into unconsciousness. When I woke up, I recalled what had happened and immediately looked for a mark where I'd felt the pain behind my knee, and I did find something that looked like a bug bite. Look, I know I may sound nuts. These are extraordinary experiences to have claimed actually happened. And even I've always been skeptical because so much of it revolves around me waking up. So, really, they could just be super realistic dreams. However, like the bug bite mark, there are a few other things that haven't been easy for me to explain or to ignore, for that matter. Three times three equals five. Four times four equals five. Five times five equals five. Back when I was in fourth grade, during class one day, blood started dripping from my nose. Just a few drops at first, and then a major gush that would not stop. I'm not sure if it was the first nosebleed I ever had, although it might have been, but the memory of it stayed with me. The other kids were pointing and making a big deal about it, and my teacher was trying not to freak out as she had me tilt my head back and sent one of the kids to run to the bathroom for toilet paper. And then as a teen, I would also wake up with blood stains on my pillow, along with having more dried blood on my nose. And again, this is happening during the period of time when I'm also having these recurring nightmares about this being standing over me while I'm sleeping. I'm an only child, 
so it's not like I had a brother messing around with me, hitting me in the face or something while I'm sleeping. Then there's the missing time episode, which happened about two years after the time I woke up and felt myself being held down and poked in the back of my right knee. One night, shortly after we'd moved into our new home, and maybe about a year before I joined the Air Force, I had just come home from work. I should mention that while moving into that house, I had injured that same knee, trying to pull our washing machine out of the moving truck up the steep driveway and into the house. I felt something pop in my right knee, and my doctor said I'd probably torn my meniscus, so she told me to rest and ice it. But anyway, that night, the plan was that I would stay at home and watch my son while his mother ran out to pick up dinner. As she was leaving the house, I was in his room putting him in bed since he had fallen asleep. I heard the front door close. A moment later, I had just turned away from his crib when I heard the front door open again. Figuring she had forgotten something, I went to see what she needed, since it hadn't even been a minute since she left. Honey? But then, when I saw what she was holding, I just stopped, staring at her, feeling completely dumbfounded. In her hands, she was carrying the food. She had to have been gone for at least 30 to 40 minutes. She asked me what was wrong, and then stuttered when she suddenly asked me why my knee was bleeding. I was wearing khaki pants, and I looked down and saw that blood had soaked through the front of my right pant leg. Taking them off, I saw that there was now a small wound on the front of my right knee, which I would say was approximately the same spot where I'd felt something pierce the back of my knee two years earlier, but this wound was in the front. The wound had a perfect triangular shape, three lines intersecting in the middle, where there was a small circular hole. I had no idea how I'd gotten this wound. But then, as my wife started helping me to clean the blood off my leg, something suddenly popped out of the center of it. It was this small black thing, about the size of a ballpoint pen tip, and roughly the same shape, only tapering off or pointed on both ends. It also looked charred or burned. Since it had only popped out halfway, my wife was able to pull it out with her fingers, and we were able to examine it for a while before it suddenly just crumbled into dust. No idea what it was. The Smoke Pit will be right back after these messages. And now, back to the stories. Since joining the military, these kinds of more obvious experiences have stopped. However, to this day, I'll randomly get the sensation that I'm being watched, or I'm not alone in an empty house. Intuitively, I seem to sense they are there. Even as I try to tell myself that I'm just imagining things, this is why I've been paying attention to the news about the DOD declassifying UFOs. Now they're called Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, or UAPs. This kind of news is validating for me. When respectable military officers like Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Alex Dietrich talk about being directed to investigate a strange radar contact and not being able to explain what they saw and captured on gun camera footage, it's certainly easier for me to talk about the things I've experienced that I can't explain. I had a friend in college who agreed to go on the air at the university's campus radio station to talk about his experiences, only to be cruelly mocked by the DJs. There's been a few other times I've told someone about all this, only to get burned. I'm not sure what anyone else has done to try and cope with this type of thing, but some time ago I discovered that writing about my experiences has been helpful. So now I write paranormal fiction. Through writing, I can explore these stories at face value and consider what it would mean if we lived in a universe where we aren't alone and in a world where they are here. Some claim these entities are angels whose mission it is to save us from ourselves, 
be it making the Earth uninhabitable through environmental catastrophe or nuclear Armageddon. Some religious people claim they are demons disguised as aliens. When I consider the possibility that the Greys and potentially other aliens are real, I don't think they're either angel or demon. The sense I have is that we are sentient lab animals to them, specimens to be tranquilized, tracked, and possibly experimented on. That's not to say they mean us harm. We do the same thing to other animals. The marine biologists on Shark Week certainly don't mean to harm the sharks that they capture and tag for future observation. In my mind, this sort of benign curiosity isn't the worst possible outcome for contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence. With luck, a few of them might be the cosmic version of Jane Goodall, who develop a deep compassion for primitive animals. And still, I can't even claim with any certainty that these are real beings, or since I am one of many, that this hasn't been some kind of shared illusion or dream that is deeply programmed into our collective human subconsciousness. I really couldn't say. So, instead, I write. As with many of these stories shared so far in the smoke pit, and now including Xavier's, I want to offer everyone my sincere thanks for giving me the opportunity to share these stories with the rest of the audience here. I certainly don't know what to make of these strange events. Although I have had my own strange experiences with dreams blending into reality. Now, the smoke pit gets weirder every day. I dare say myself and Xavier both look forward to reading your comments. As for Xavier, with regard to his writing, I want to offer him my congratulations, as he is now a published author, his first book being released just this past week, on May 4th. As much as I have found it therapeutic, in a way, sharing my own military experiences through the stories here on the channel, his writing and his stories certainly convey not only his own military experience, but the emotional and psychological impact his paranormal experiences have had on him. He wanted to sponsor the video, but I simply couldn't accept. I told him no. The opportunity to share his personal story was more than enough. But I do want to promote his incredible work, as I am more than happy to share his book with those of you who are looking for something new and downright chilling to read. Be sure to check out his book. There is a link here, and for more information, there are more links in the description section of this video. I mentioned at the beginning there would be multiple stories like this. There most certainly are, and those will continue in the next Smoke Pit episode. Up next, we will hear another personal account, this one from a man living in the state of Georgia who, like Xavier, has had an unusual series of experiences which seem to blur the line between his dreams and his waking reality. Thank you all for watching. If you also have a story to share with us, you are welcome to post it in the comment section or to email me at wartimestories.yt at gmail.com. I do have some closing thoughts coming up in the credits, but whether in dreams or in reality or somewhere in between, I will see you in the next episode.
Hey guys, thanks again for sticking around for the credits. As of the making of this episode, there are just about 68,000 subscribers to this channel. Thank you for subscribing, by the way. While working with Xavier's story to create this episode, along with reading your other various accounts that you've shared in the comments or emailed to me, many of which haven't been put into episodes yet, I have to admit that this is the first time I've ever really had the opportunity to speak with someone like him. Someone who has these sorts of very detailed accounts of his experiences with high strangeness, specifically regarding aliens. Xavier told you this himself, but with 68,000 people to speak to, although given the nature of the channel, I'm sure most of you are very open-minded, I suppose I can't be the only one who would acknowledge that, for some time now, some degree of our society would view a person like Xavier, a person who claims to have been abducted or to have had actual interactions with alien beings, to be the stereotypical tinfoil hat-wearing kind of person, and that these sorts of experiences are clearly delusions and can't be taken seriously. And I must admit, at least for some part of my life, I would probably have counted myself among that group of people to think that and to dismiss these stories as delusions. But then, I'm, I'm wondering if anyone else has had a similar experience, because although it has nothing to do with aliens or other strangeness, his story reminds me that I also have at least one or two strange memories from my childhood that I still cannot seem to confirm as being either a vivid dream or something that actually happened. One of these memories was when I was eight, and my fourth grade teacher was being replaced for the day by a substitute. And I noticed a lot of the kids in the class were starting to whisper about the substitute teacher when I walked into the class and sat down. All of the other kids just seemed oddly excited to see her, is what I was thinking. And when she finally introduced herself to us, this woman addressed the entire class, and she said something like, Hello everyone, I will be your substitute teacher since Miss Allen is out for the day, and she asked me to stand in for her. And to those of you who have been asking, yes, my name is Uma Thurman, and I played Poison Ivy in the Batman movie. She said it just like that. But even after she said that, while the rest of the class was freaking out, I was just sitting there confused, because I still had no idea who she was or why anyone cared. You know, it just... I should point out that I don't think my family had a TV at that point. Um... Maybe not until I was 10, maybe later that, that uh, when I was 9 or something. I actually grew up listening to old radio shows and cassette tapes. Uh, that's, that's how my family rolled. Uh, and even when we got a TV, we never had cable television. We would just rent VHS tapes once a week. Um, and yes, my parents did take us to see movies in the theater, but since I was 8, my parents would never have let me watch that PG-13 Batman and Robin movie that she was in, which had in fact been released a few months earlier, in June of 1997, that same year, during our summer break. And I still haven't even watched the movie till now. So, although all of the facts line up perfectly, when I look back on it, you know, the whole thing seems ridiculous to me. But then I still have a hard time believing it was a dream. You know, I loved Star Wars as a kid, but I knew nothing about Batman. I didn't watch the cartoons, the movies, or anything. So, you know, how could I dream that up? And it makes no sense to me why she, of all people, a well-known celebrity, would be standing in for my teacher, Miss Allen, who she was apparently friends with. So, unless I ever get a chance to ask Uma Thurman if she substituted for a fourth grade class in Florida sometime around Halloween in 1997, I will never know if that actually happened. So like Xavier and his experiences with aliens, I'm still not sure what to think about any of it. But what I can't help but to acknowledge is that at a minimum, whether it's Robert's Fort Campbell and Honduras stories or the various smoke pit stories, this channel has introduced me to people who, had I met them before they shared these strange experiences with me, you know, I, I would have considered them completely rational, down-to-earth, and by all accounts, you know, normal people. Because that's how they are. They're certainly not the tinfoil hat-wearing kind of people that I might have seen wandering around a parking lot when I was, you know, a teenager. So I guess my point is, perhaps 
among you 68,000 subscribers out there, maybe like me, you've enjoyed listening to strange and creepy stories for some time now. But for me, it's not until recently, having now had the opportunity to meet people with strange experiences, that you know, I'm reminded of my own possibly strange experiences. And that perhaps we have all had some type of experience like this. And for some, it manifests as aliens. And for some, it, it manifests as having celebrities substitute your, your, your classes. You know, whatever the truth really is, whether spiritual, extraterrestrial, psychological, or all of the above. Are they the result of vivid dreams blending with reality? We may never know. In any case, thanks for listening. Be sure to check out Xavier's book, either on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. The links are in the video description. And as always, a sincere thank you to my patrons and YouTube channel members for going above and beyond the call of duty and allowing me to spend more time creating these stories than I could without your incredible support. <laughs>